I'm back looking at the book of Joshua. Joshua, one of the most amazing, and I believe underrated characters in the entire Bible. But the book of Joshua, it's like a action-packed movie. And you can just read it over and over again. It's not a long book. It's 24 chapters. It's 658 verses and 18,858 words written around 1450 B.C. to 1400 B.C. Written sometime in there. And it has to do with entering the promised land. And Jesus is pictured as the captain of our salvation. In every book of the Bible, Jesus is the main theme. You see him behind the scenes in some way. And Joshua 5.15, he shows up as the captain of the Lord's host, the angel of the Lord, in Joshua 5.15. Now, the three applications. Historically, what Joshua is about is Israel receiving the promised land. Doctrinally, the battles in Joshua picture the second coming of Christ. Inspirationally, what can me and you get out of it the most? Claiming the promises to defeat the giants of life. Christian warfare. You know, you can look at these battles and God helps Israel win battles that they're not going to win without him. God's going to help us win battles in this life that look impossible that we can't win without him. And... In that sense, Joshua shows the militant side of Christianity. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And you know, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means the weapons we're using, we got a spiritual sword. Hebrews 4, 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 18 says, This charge I commend unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. We're not uh, warring a good warfare with a physical sword uh, and slaying people physically. We got a spiritual sword. We're using this spiritual sword to try to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And get them on our side. So. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now the author of this book is. Joshua and Samuel. Now you think about the name Joshua. The name Joshua is the name for Jesus. In. Acts 7.45, it, it call, in the New Testament, it calls Joshua Jesus. It's the same name. And Joshua is a great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to see him picture Jesus Christ in so many ways, as I told you in the last lesson. So in this book, Moses pictures the law. Moses is already dead and gone. But he pictures the law. He couldn't get them into the promised land. Joshua, a picture of Jesus, does get them into the promised land. So that's an amazing picture there. Now the enemies in the land picture what we fight to possess a victorious Christian life. A little bit more about Joshua's name. He's also called Oshea. O-S-H-E-A. Oshea. He's also called Hoshea. H-O-S-H-E-A. See Deuteronomy 32.44. In Numbers 13.16, he's called Jehoshua. J-E-H-O-S-H-U-A. And that's just abbreviated down to Joshua. Now, Joshua means Jehovah's salvation. 
and Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua. So that's some stuff about his name. Now, here's a little bit more info about Joshua. First Chronicles 7.27 shows you that Joshua was the firstborn of Nun. N-U-N. His father's name was Nun. He was the firstborn of Nun. So Joshua would have would have been, you know, relying heavily on the blood of the lamb in the Passover. Because if they didn't have the blood on the doorpost, the firstborn would get killed. You know, they, they'd get slaughtered. So he would have been relying heavily on the blood. Just like me and you. We rely heavily on the blood of the lamb. And his hope was in the blood. And Exodus 17, 9, Joshua held great discernment in choosing soldiers. In Exodus 17, 10, Joshua honored God-given authority. And you know, in Exodus 17, uh, he shows his battle skills because he helps them take out Amalek. You know, the, Joshua is an amazing character. And like we talked about last week, he was in the service of bondage in Egypt. He was a soldier in God's army. He survived the plagues. He sacrificed a lamb. He stocked up on manna. He stood still at the Red Sea. He sang a new song. He scaled Mount Sinai. He had his senses exercised. He had a sword in hand. He spied out the enemy. So many amazing events the character Joshua went through, and he's literally in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. All those events and those five books, you see Joshua. A lot of people don't think about that, but that's an amazing thing. Now here is some outlines for the book of Joshua. In chapters 1 through 12, they divide and conquer. Chapters 1 through 5, they enter the land. 6 through 12, they fight the inhabitants. Now, chapters 13 through 14, they divide and colonize. Now, here's a little bit more broke down outline. Chapter 1, you got the commission and command of Joshua. Chapter 2, he's sending in the spies, and you got Rahab's scarlet thread. Chapter 3, you got crossing over Jordan. Chapter 4, you got the memorial stones. Chapter 5, you got Israel circumcised the second time. And that's where you see the captain of the Lord of hosts. Chapter 6, you got the battle of Jericho and Rahab saved. 7, <clears throat> you got Ai, the battle of Ai and the sin of Achan. You got, in chapter 8, you got the battle of Ai where Ai is conquered. Chapter 9, you got... The Gibeonites trick Israel. And chapter 10, you got where the sun stands still and the Amorite kings killed. Chapter 11, you got the conquests in the north. Chapter 12, you got conquered kings showing you that you need to remember your victories. Chapter 13, you got the land that's still to be possessed. Showing you that, you know, there's always something left for you to do. Even when you think you arrive, you, there's always something left for you to do. Chapter 14, you got Caleb's inheritance. Chapter 15, you got the allotment for Judah. 16, you got the allotment for Ephraim and Manasseh. 17, you got the allotment for Manasseh. Uh, 18, you got uh, allotment of the remaining land. Chapter 19, you got inheritance of tribes. Chapter 20, you got the cities of refuge. And Jesus is ours. Chapter 21, you got cities for Levites. Chapter 22, you got eastern tribes return home. Uh, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. 
chapter 23, you got Joshua's charge to Israel's leaders. Chapter 24, you got Joshua's farewell address. So the book of Joshua, it's an action-packed, amazing book. Now with that being said, let's try to get a few verses in. In Joshua chapter 1. Probably won't make it too far in it, but just get a few few look at a few verses. So go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter one and follow right along. Joshua one verse one says, Now after the death of Moses. Now you think about this for a minute. Think about that statement. Moses is dead, but Moses lives on. Joshua's going to be a successor. Moses isn't going to lead them into the promised land. But Moses continues to work even after his death. And I want you to think about this. Hebrews 9, 27. But as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You're going to die one day. And you need to continue to work after your death. And you need to cause them to say after your death that you fought to the finish. You fought to the finish. Look at Deuteronomy 34, 5 through 7. And Deuteronomy 34, 5 through 7 it says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died, and his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. He didn't start getting old and frail he was still moving around like a young man his eye wasn't dim he could still see good his natural force was a, wasn't abated god didn't take away his physical fitness and moses he didn't get to go into the promised land he did, he messed up a time or two but he fought to the finish now after the death of moses people would have been saying that now you think about this, you're going to die one day. What are people going to say after the death of you? Are they going to say that you fought a good fight and finished your course and kept the faith? Are they going to say you you really made a mess of things? He Are they going to say, you know, he did good at the beginning, but he kind of fell off at the end? Now here's some things that need to be taking place after your death. Just like it happened for Moses. Moses, after his death, continued to cause trouble for evil. He continued to cause trouble for evil. See, after the death of Moses, nobody could find his body. It said, No man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. It said that in Deuteronomy 34, 6. That includes the devil. No man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. In Jude 9... You know the famous story in Jude 9, Jude verse 9, where it says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Moses was dead and still causing trouble for the devil. Did you know a Christian who lives for the Lord? You, a Christian today, you can cause trouble for the devil. And you can cause trouble for the devil even after you're dead. You can be a thorn to evil by leaving something behind. You, name, you may not be walking the earth anymore, but you can leave something behind that's going to be a thorn in the flesh of the enemy. And you think about just these lessons. I mean, if, if I die tomorrow, hopefully... These lessons will remain on here and people will continue to listen to them. I'm wanting to put them on uh, 
USB drives or whatever you call them, the, the thumb drives or the um, external hard drives so that my kids can listen to them. Maybe pass them down to somebody else and people can get help from these lessons and I can continue to be a thorn in the flesh of the devil even after I die. So, after the death of you, you want to continue to cause trouble for evil. Maybe you've made some gospel tracks, and uh, people are going to continue printing out those gospel tracks and handing them out even after you're dead. And maybe on those gospel tracks, it might say your name at the bottom of it. And every time those gospel tracts are passed out and somebody gets saved, the devil sees your name on the bottom of that gospel tract and he's saying, this guy's still causing me trouble. I killed him long ago. I killed his flesh long ago and he's still causing me trouble. Now, after the death of Moses, he continued to cause trouble for evil. After the death of Moses, you can count on him coming back. See, after the death of you, it's not the end of you. You can count on coming back. And Moses does come back in Matthew 17, 3. On the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah show up there on the Mount of Transfiguration together. Uh, he's going to come back in Revelation 11 in the Tribulation as one of the two witnesses. You read in Revelation 11, 3 through 6 about the two witnesses. Moses comes back. His story isn't over. You know, guess what? You know, you're going to die. Or you're going to go out in the rapture. But you're coming back. Revelation 19, 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You're coming back at the second coming. It's not over for you. You know, don't see death as this bad thing. It's not over for you. You're coming back. Just like Moses already came back and he's coming back. What's another thing? After the death of Moses, he continued to cause trouble for evil. You know, you can count on him coming back. And another thing about Moses is he counseled a replacement. Moses was mentor to Joshua. See, are you in the fight and training someone to take your place after your death? Is somebody going to be able to step in and fill your shoes even after you're dead? Maybe a son, maybe a student of yours. Maybe you're a pastor and you got all kinds of people that, that you're training up that it's going to take your place. You need to be training them with the motive of going further than you did. You want them to go further than you. You don't want to be the top dog forever. And when you're gone, they're just saying, oh, I wish we had him back. We can't do it like he did. No, you want them to take it further than you. You, need, you want to be training up somebody in the way they should go. That way, after the death of you... You got somebody that's going to take them, take people further. You see, Moses pictures the law. It's dead to you, Romans seven four. You know the law can only get you so far. It's your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ, but Joshua took them further. Joshua pictures Jesus Christ. With Jesus Christ, you're under grace. Jesus Christ can take you to the promised land. He can get you saved and get you into that victorious Christian life. Joshua pictures Jesus. Joshua got them into the promised land. Moses couldn't get them into the promised land. He pictures the law. Joshua does. He pictures Jesus. So Moses counseled a replacement. He took Joshua under his wing, and Joshua is his replacement. So you need to be training up somebody, somebody that can take you further, that can take the people further. That can go beyond what you did. You know, you need to t teach somebody everything you know. Then they know everything you know and can build on that. So that's what we're trying to do. You take what 
these former saints knew, and you build on that. And then you die, and then somebody builds on all that. Now, after the death of you, are they going to, are you going to continue to cause trouble for the Lord? Are you counting on coming back? Have you counseled a replacement? Are you, the next thing, are you going to close your life serving the Lord? You know, Moses, the servant of the king of kings, it says Moses, the servant, Moses, the servant of the Lord. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Moses was called a king. He was called the king of Jeshurun. But he is under the king of kings. You see, leading involves serving. You may be in some position of authority, but are you serving the Lord? Everybody's serving somebody. You've got to learn how to follow authority. In 1 Timothy 6.15, it says, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. You know, a lot of times authority or something could get to your head and you'll start serving yourself and getting others to serve you like a cult leader, but you want to close your life serving the Lord and be like Moses after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Isn't that what you want said about you after the death of, insert your name here, the servant of the Lord? What if that was right on your tombstone? The servant of the Lord. That's what I want to be known as, the servant of the Lord. So, that's just a few things about Moses there. You know, after the death of Moses, he still continued to make an effect. No man knew of his sepulcher, not even the devil. The devil was disputing with, with Jude, or with uh, Michael the archangel and Jude over the body of Moses. After the death of Moses, Joshua takes over a picture of Jesus getting us into the promised land. And we'll go ahead and stop there and get more into Joshua next time.